All right, without looking, can you name the word that is imprinted on our penny to the left of Abraham Lincoln's profile? Do you know which way Abraham Lincoln is facing? On the tail side of the penny, there is an image of a building. What building is it? To the right of, a build, of the building, there are initials. What are they? Now I want you to think about this. This is a, a piece of money that you have looked at how many times? How many times have you seen a penny? How many times have you, now some of the younger ones probably don't see it, see it as much, but you think about how many times you've seen a penny, yet when I ask you to describe that penny, what are the words on it? What, what, which way Abraham Lincoln is facing? What are the initials on the back? What is the building on the back? We guess, right? At best, we guess. Especially since I've lived in Mesquite. Now, here's what, here's what I want you to think about. Here's what I want you to think about. Have you ever noticed that human beings, when we think we already know something, we don't pay attention to it. When we think that that when something is familiar, familiar to us, we don't really consider it very often. We don't stop and think about it very often. Uh, it often will stifles our impulse to study it and to view it and to look at it because we're just so familiar with it. We don't have to look at things that we think we already know, right? We don't look at things we think we already know. I think this is one of the big problems when it comes to how we follow Jesus. When we call our, we do our discipling of Jesus, when we talk about being disciples of Jesus, one of our big problems is that we think we know Jesus, right? We're so familiar with him, especially those of us who maybe have been raised in church our entire lives and we've heard all the stories over and over and over again. It is very easy for us to take Jesus for granted. It's very easy for us not to slow down and actually look at who he is and what he is doing. I, I just saw a tweet today that was amazing to me. It said... Um, this woman started reading through the book of Mark and she says, I have not got through a chapter yet without weeping. My Jesus is that beautiful. And I, and I just thought, wow, she is taking the time to, to behold Jesus. Of course, we just did a whole entire series on being in awe of God and how important it is to be in awe of God. And one of the subtle dangers in the way that Christians do discipleship is that we somehow look at Jesus without ever seeing him, right? We, we look at him. Uh, there has been countless romantic movies that have used this, uh, this little phrase where a uh, husband and wife, a boyfriend and girlfriend have been together for a long time and they, they become so accustomed to one another that they stop seeing each other, right? And that becomes the existential crisis in the movie. And it's like, finally, I see you. I see you. I recognize you. I, I'm aware of you. I'm beholding you. I'm, I'm, and sometimes we, we, we get so um, familiar with Jesus that we can look at him without ever really seeing him. One of the best words in the entire Bible, I've already said it a couple times tonight, is the word behold. It's one of the best words in the entire Bible. Unfortunately, some of our modern translations actually just take the word behold out and just replace it with look or replace it with see. And, and I know that that can be a synonym. I understand that. But what, what happens is that when you just replace it with see or look, then you think it's just about a glance, right? It's just about looking that direction instead of the word behold, which I think is an improvement on the ordinary word simply to look. 
I want to read just a few verses here to you. You have them in, in your notes. But Psalm 63, verse 2. Psalm 63, verse 2. The psalmist writes this. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. I like that better than seeing your power and glory. Beholding your power and glory. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 44. Verse 4. And he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord. So he, he looks and then beholds again. So different than I looked and then I saw the glory of God. John chapter one, verse 29. The New Testament for us, John chapter one. Verse 29. John the Baptist is baptizing. Jesus walks up in the midst of him baptizing. And then in verse 29 it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not, look, there's the Lamb of God. Behold him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. These verses simply do not sound the same. They do not carry the same weight if you just use look or see. I'm suggesting that the word behold, I'm very thankful for the ESV and leaving the, that word behold in there. I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that that word behold is really what Christianity is all about. When we did our series on all, the, the only way we become in awe of God is to behold him. You don't become in awe of God by simply looking at him or just seeing him or uh, glancing at him. You have to behold him. John wants us to see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Like he wants people to actually turn their heads and look at him with eyeballs. Right? He does want them to turn and to look at Yeshua walking to the Jordan River. But he wants them to do more than just look. He wants them to behold. It's the kind of seeing that he wants, right? So I want you to see him, but, I, but there's a kind of seeing that I want you to do. And it goes beyond just the optics with your eyes. There's a, there's a, a deeper sense in what I want you to see. In other words, it's not just look at him. He's telling them, I want you to look with consideration. I want you to look with appreciation, with fixation and um, transfiction even. When we use the word to behold, <coughs> really means to hold on to something. To behold something is to hold to something in our vision. To let the weight of it rest upon us, rest upon our mind, rest upon our heart. When we say behold God, what we, what we have to do is we want to, to hold on to who he is. We want to, to look upon the weight of who he is and let that sit on us. I've actually used that language before. My family kind of teases me when I, I say that every once in a while. But just let this sit on you for a minute. Let this weigh on you for a minute. But that's what I want. I want it. I want the truth of what was said to, to sit upon our minds, to sit upon our hearts, and for the weight of it 
to be appreciated and for us to consider it and fixate on it. It is possible to look without beholding. It is possible. You can look at Jesus without really seeing him. People do it all the time. It is possible to look at Jesus without really seeing him. In John chapter 4, you can turn there. Uh, we will not be reading all 422 verses. <laughs> John chapter 4, your notes uh, messed up there a little bit. Uh, oh, I thought that was a spot that this morning. Oh, no, yeah. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but John 4. But this entire chapter, almost all of it, is when Jesus goes to Samaria and meets the woman at the well. Um, and there's just no way around it. We have to read this in order for us to understand and catch the weight of what is said. Now when Jesus, verse 1, learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, let that sink in for a minute. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Did you notice that? He had to pass through Samaria. Now listen to me. Geologically speaking, he didn't have to. In fact, a lot of Jews would go around Samaria on purpose. All right? Because the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Really, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And they would actually go around. But here it says Jesus had to go through Samaria. That is more about purpose than it is about geography. Okay? Had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar near the field of Jacob, who had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So afternoon, hot, heat of the day. People don't go to the well during this time of day. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? I am a, Samar a woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked me. And he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself as his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of the water, this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. And the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. Doesn't get it. Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one that you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Uh, just to let you know, um, the theological view of the Samaritans is very, very possible that she is calling him the prophet that was prophesied. The, the Samaritans did not believe in any of the books of the Old Testament except the first five. So they did not believe in any of the history books. They didn't, they didn't use the books of prop, the prop, uh, uh, poems and poetry. They didn't use any of the prophets. In fact, the Samaritans didn't believe in prophets. So when the Samaritan said to Jesus, you are a prophet, the only other prophet they were waiting for was the messianic prophet that would that would look like Moses because there's that passage in the Old Testament that says I will raise up one like Moses. They were waiting for the next prophet to be like Moses who was going to be the Messiah. So when she says you are a prophet, um, that in the Greek there's not an a there, so it is you know uh, you are prophet. It's very possible that she was saying I'm perceiving that you're you might be the Messiah here. Just a side note. It has nothing to do with our lesson. But very, very interesting. Because there's some debate over exactly what she means. I, I did a deep dive into this um, 
And uh, my conclusion is that's probably what she's meaning. She, she's not for sure yet. She's not saying you are the Messiah, but it's starting to dawn on her that this isn't, there's something going on here with this man. And it's very possible he, he's the one we've been waiting for. Um, so let's keep going. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. If the hour is coming, it is now here when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. This woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. You see what's happening? Like she's starting to kind of, I think, put, put some dots together. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. And they marveled that he was talking to a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Yeah, good call. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ, the anointed one? I love that she leaves her water jar there. Like She came to get water, and she leaves, and the last thing she's worried about is physical water, right? They went out of the town and were coming to him, and he ends up. Many people, because of her testimony, come to the Lord. We can stop there for now. <coughs> now, one thing among many things in this passage, uh, Jesus does not care about your personal space, does he? Like he gets all up in her personal space. He shows up at the well. She shows up at the well. Not, not by happenstance. Not just coincidence that, oh, wow, someone's coming. All right? Any natural person would have gone to the well in the afternoon and expecting to see nobody. That is not the time that people would go. It was the heat of the day. You don't go there unless you're hiding from something, unless you're trying to avoid people. And that's exactly why she went. She was going to avoid people. This woman was uh, probably an outcast in Samaria, and, and so she was going at a different time than all the, other, the rest of the women. The rest of the women would go, and they, they would go in the morning, and she wouldn't go with the rest of them because she was a sinner. And she had been with five men, and the man she's with now is not her husband. And, um, and she comes there so that her business is not anybody else's business. And Jesus steps into the story and just makes her business his business. And look at this. The very first thing Jesus does is say, give me a drink. Like he starts with a command. He doesn't say... Um, listen, if it's not too much of a bother, you mind getting me a drink? He commands her, give me a drink. Now, the reason why that's important and, and interesting is because so many people have a portrait of Jesus as, as this kind of shy, unassuming person who would love to say you, save you if it's just not too much bother to you. Like, I would love to do something in your life as long as it's not too troubling for you. He's, he's not stooping over with his hat in his hand, um, hoping that you'll notice him and let him into your life. He's not the beggar um, knocking at the door saying, please, somebody, just accept this poor, meek, mild Savior. He shows up in this lady's life and he's just, he starts by giving orders. He starts by getting in her business because he's come there to change her. The real Jesus shows up uninvited and starts giving orders. That's the real Jesus that we have. Now, what is amazing, again, this goes against all customs, men and women, a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman. Um, Samaritan women to Jewish men were considered to be ceremonially unclean permanently. So to even deal with this woman, much less to eat and drink with the woman, was breaking all of the regular customs. And when Jesus starts talking about spiritual things, she's really confused, isn't she? She keeps thinking he's talking about real water. I love the line when he says, you know, 
If you knew who it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for water and I would give you living water that would spring up to eternal life. And she's like, uh, where, where can I get that water so I don't have to ever come back here again? She's thinking, you're going to give me some water that just kind of uh, oh, just reproduces itself over and over and over again. I don't ever have to come back to the well. I can avoid this heat of the day thing. But what Jesus is doing is he's exposing this woman's greatest vulnerability. He's, he's attacking her right where she needs to be attacked. And it's interesting that, that there's areas of our lives and, and the areas of our lives that we most try to hide from the Lord are the very areas that he wants to come to and cover with his grace. <clears throat> See, here's the thing that, that amazes me about us. We know, listen, we know that God already sees these areas we try to hide. It shows you how irrational sin is. Here we are sinning, trying to hide this vulnerability, trying to hide this area of our lives from God when we know rationally he knows that this is in my life. Why am I trying to hide this from him? Instead of taking it to the Lord and saying, here is the most hidden thing in my life, Lord, here it is. Knowing that God desires those areas so that he can pour out his grace on them. What we've done is we've seen the way that we've treated each other when people get vulnerable, which is sometimes not a beautiful thing, and we think that God's going to do the same thing. He will never. God will never take anyone who comes to him with the hidden parts of their lives and the vulnerabilities of their lives. No one who ever comes to him will receive anything but grace. Ever. Think about that. No matter how dark no matter how tragic, no matter how broken, there is nothing when you bring it to God that does not get showered with his grace. Adam and Eve sinned. What did they do? They covered it up, right? They didn't own it. They covered it up. And, and I, you, know, you just pictured God walking in the garden and they're straightening, straightening up the fig leaves, make sure all the embarrassing parts are covered up, Right? They're thinking about the cover-up while Jesus is, I mean, while God is already thinking about the sacrifice that's going to be made to cover them up. Many people come to Jesus. They want some kind of pick-me-up. They want some kind of, of um, just a spiritual guru. And Jesus comes in the flesh. Jesus comes in our lives um, offering himself. We need to behold him. The point of following Jesus is to behold him and come like him. That's what Paul said. As we, with unveiled face, View and behold the Lord. What happens to us? We are transformed from glory to glory. You don't go from glory to glory unless you behold. The way that we move from place to place is beholding him for who he is. And then we, we go from this level of glory to the next level of glory. That's how we move. That's how we're getting sanctified that's how we're becoming holy in our actions is that we're beholding him and it's often right in front of us jesus is right in front of us we can read mark and weep if we will jesus is right in front of this woman at the well right in front of her and she doesn't see until he continues to work on her to get her to see the one that's standing right in front of you i am he I am the one you've been waiting on. Every day when you encounter God, your devotional time, our congregational times of worship, our classes, we have a choice to either look at him or behold him. I'm either just going to look or I'm going to behold. And I promise you, if you will behold him, you will start moving from glory to glory. You will start moving from glory to glory. Here's one problem that we have as human beings and, and we have it as Christians as well is that we've lost our capacity for bigness. 
Um, we've allowed the small things to dull our spiritual senses. Many of us simply do not have a capacity for things that are big. That's why we freak out over the little things. We've, we've lost our, our sense of, of how giant and huge things really are. And Christians do the same thing with God. We struggle to behold Christ's glory because we've generally decreased our capacity for bigness. Now, I'm going to give you a practical thing you can do. This is just one practical thing. Okay? Um, I do this often, and it really does work because it's biblical. How do we, how can you practically, if you say, okay, Neil, I, I get it. Like, I don't get wowed by, by big stuff. Like, I just get so worn down with the minutia of the little things that I miss the big stuff. And I, I want my heart to be big and open and wide and to be able to absorb giant things into my being. Like, I want to do this. I want to behold Christ and, and how big that he is. I want to consume who he is. Well, here's one thing you can do. Just stop every once in a while. Okay? Just stop the craziness. Put the phone up or whatever. Just stop. Take a breath. Look around. And specifically, look up. Look up. Look at the sky. Think about how giant what you're looking at actually is. I love doing it at day and at night, and I, I like to just sit and contemplate on how giant this thing is. For instance, we live on a planet that is not even remotely close to the largest planet in our solar system. Millions of our planet can fit inside of the star we call the sun. Millions of our suns can fit in other stars in the, in the universe. We have found stars that our sun fits into a million times. <clears throat> you can go to YouTube, and I encourage you to do this every once in a while because it helps you when you go out and you start looking up. Go to YouTube. Watch the video where it starts with you on earth and it just keeps panning back and panning back and panning back. Eventually, you can't even see earth anymore. And then it gets to, the, to the, the last piece of the universe that we know of. And then they estimate how far you have to go before you reach anything, the next anything. We're talking about millions of light years. Like this is this thing is ginormous. And we walk around getting to look at it every night and every day. We don't even, we don't even think about it. Like there is a huge ball of fire in the sky. Think about that. It is a ball of gas burning. There's it's not it's not a rock. It's just a ball of gas burning that is heating up our earth. And we get to go look at that thing. We get to, to go and, and look at the stars. I have an app on my iPad and on my phone that I, it's called um, something sky, I can't remember. And you hold it up, there's like a dollar right it's worth it. You hold it up <laughs> and it shows you what you're looking at at night in the sky. You can see Jupiter and it shows you Venus and Mars and and there was a night during the summer, I went outside and I, I just pulled that up. And you, you had the moon, you had Mars, you had Venus, and you had Jupiter all visible to the naked eye. That just wowed me. Just to stand there and be like, this, this thing is so huge. This is so big. And this is, this is biblical, by the way. Because the Bible says in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
So literally, as you're looking up to the sky, I know as odd as it sounds, but observing the sky, observing the heavens can expand your capacity for bigness. Resting from spaces where you think you are sovereign and getting out to spaces where it's obvious that God is sovereign, where, where the sovereignty of God is more, more palpable, it will help you see Christ bigger. Because see, we run around in the smallness where we think we're sovereign, right? Stuff we're in control of. I'm in control of this, and I'm in control of that, and I'm in control of this, and I'm in control of that. And what happens is, is that you make yourself big because you think you're in control of these things. So what's great is to get outside of that space where you think you're sovereign, which you're not, but where you think you're in control, and step out to a bigness where it is very obvious that God is sovereign over all of this. And you just realize how big he is, that he holds it, this universe that we can't even measure, that's expanding all the time, he's holding it in the palm of his hand as if it is nothing. Star walk. Star walk. That's the name of it. <laughs> I love this sentence that is written in the book. Want a heart as big as the sky? Behold the sky. Love that. A sense of bigness can come over us. Ray Ortland once said, stare at the glory of God until you see it. Stare at the glory of God until you see it like Jacob wrestling with the Lord. Like, I'm not letting go, go of you until you bless me. Like, I am not letting go of you until you bless me. I'm going to stare at your glory until I start seeing it bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. And as I've already said, you can look without seeing, but you cannot see without looking. So we have to look. Here's, here's the problem, is that we, nor we don't look directly at the glory. We kind of just look in varying degrees off to the left or the right. So the glory is right here. I mean, it's like the sun, right? We don't look directly at it. We have to look on either side of it, right? Or it hurts our eyes. But we do that with God when we don't have to divert our attention away. We can look directly at the point of glory, but we tend to look to the right or the left. Let me give you an example of how we do this. We make... Christianity about something that it's not. And once you make it about something that it's not, you're not staring, you're not beholding the glory anymore. You're, you're, you're coming to a place where you're going to be satisfied with a lesser glory than the actual glory. I love that our kids are doing Gospel Project. Here's why. Because Gospel Project on Sunday nights, every single lesson is about Jesus. Every lesson. Here's what, we, here's what we do so often in our churches is that our goal, especially with our children, and then it just works its way up into our adult programs as well. Our goal is to make good little boys and girls. And so the way to make good little boys and girls, we think, is to teach them all moral lessons from the story. We're going to take every story in the Bible, and instead of it being about Jesus, we're going to make it about you and how you need to be more moral. How you need to behave better. And so we take every story and we, we make it about making good little boys and girls rather than making it all about Jesus. Now this is done with good intentions. Many of you were taught, we follow the rules. We behave properly. Usually at the expense of seeing Jesus. What I want for my kids is not just to behave properly. I want them to see Jesus and that's why they want to behave properly. I want them to stare straight into the face of the glory of Christ. I, don't, I, I want them veering right or left to the rules. I want them staring straight at the glory of Christ because that's what will change their life. Here's the problem. There is not enough glory. Now listen to this carefully. There is not enough glory in the commands themselves to help us obey them. There is not enough glory 
in the actual commands to help us obey them. There's a lot of glory. There's not enough glory. There is an insufficient glory in the law of God to empower us to obey it. There is great glory in the law of God. Okay? Make no mistake about it. The law of God was perfect. And there was great glory in the law of God. But there was not enough glory in the law of God to change people. There was not enough glory in the law of God to change hearts, to enable them to obey it. So the gospel has come, which is a greater glory than the glory of the law. The gospel has come to enable us to be what we're supposed to be. It's like a star when the sun rises. What happens to the... Does that star stop shining during the day? No, they don't go out. What happens is, is that the brightness of the sun overcomes the glory of that star. That's what's happened. The law of God is perfect and beautiful. But what happens is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ begins to shine. And what happens is, is that it overcomes the glory of the law because it is greater. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. Yeah, that's it. I was, I mean, I'm not, just one chapter over. I'm not reading it. We're moving on. Can't get fooled again. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, the gospel is better than the law. And yes, beholding is better than behaving. The entirety of the Christian life is not about you become a good, being a good Christian. The more you think that Christianity is about be, you being a good Christian, it is going to make you a terrible Christian and a depressed Christian. The good news of the gospel is, is not do, it is done. Amen. The good news is not instructions to say get to work, but the work is done. That's what the gospel is. Amen. And this is going to be a struggle our entire lives. Do not believe the lie that, and this is what people do, guys. Man, this is what people do. It is, I have seen it as kids have gone off to college. I have seen it as kids move from our youth department into, here's, here's the lie they believe. It is easier just to not do the battle anymore. And just go with my flesh. It's easier that way. Let me tell you something. I promise you it is not. It is better to be in the battle. It is better to fight your flesh every day. And fight to behold God every day. Than it is just to give up and go with sin. Because of where it ends up leading. It leads to destruction. It leads to misery and dissatisfaction. God, I love this. God did not make us to feel good all the time on this side of the second coming. He meant for us to share in His sufferings so that we can share in His resurrection. So we live in the limbo of Romans 7, Romans 8. Very first lesson we did. And we will always be fighting this battle. Now, when I say that, say that it is better to behold than to behave, I do not mean that we are lazy Christians who don't care about holiness. That's ridiculous. I just mean that our ability to follow Jesus has got to be centrally driven by beholding Him. Not by creating <laughs> rules for ourselves. Not by be, trying to be a better Christian. You ever try to be a better Christian? Find out real quick. Yeah, I stink at this. <laughs> I stink at this trying to be a better Christian thing. This is exhausting. Amen. But what happens is when you behold Christ, when the central part of your discipleship is beholding the glory of God, you will be changed. You can't behold Jesus and stay where you are. You can't. Beholding Christ's glory is the number one directive for following Jesus. 
Sometimes people are so busy trying to do great things for God, they forget to look at his glory, and therefore they never behold him. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it just takes all the energy I have just to look where I'm supposed to look. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes all I've got is to make sure I'm looking the right place. Because I'm pathetic. So you just think about how exhausting it is to try to just make yourself this better thing. It doesn't work that way. You can create all the rules you want. It doesn't work that way. What we do is we behold Jesus Christ. And as we behold him with unveiled face, we will start moving from glory to glory. We will start changing things that we used to, that used to carry so much weight in our lives, will just stop carrying so much weight. We've replaced it with the weight of glory.